How would you describe the difference between the American laws and a developing country like South Africa's animal rights laws? Are they? You would. I would assume they they behind. Is that the case? Well, actually, I would say South Africa's they're 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 very similar in a lot of ways. Uh, they they all are rooted in the same kind of principles. So th those South Africa's are, are is I would say better than than that in many states in the United States. Our our law is it differs from state to state, whereas yours is more of a national yeah. national um, law, and yours is a bit stronger, but in in some respects, but. They are all flawed in, in fundamental ways. They, they're rooted in, in 19th century uh, ways of protecting animals, which were extremely progressive at the time, but which were stated in very general terms, such as preventing unnecessary cruelty or being humane. Uh, and these terms are these huge cracks through which millions of, billions of animals fall, because what I think is humane and what I think is unnecessary is very different from what the industry thinks is unnecessary and what is humane. And uh, they, they tend not to be enforced in the way that most people would expect them to be enforced. But they, get, they sometimes give people the assurance that animals are be, being protected when they really aren't. Yeah. That, that's exactly the argument I heard, uh, unfortunately, uh, a couple of years ago when I was talking to uh, uh, folks in Ottawa in Canada and also having to update antiquated laws uh, you know, to protect, as, as you say. Uh, and looking at a practical example, there was uh, an actual arrest, which I gather is a bit of um, progress, at least, for a, a South African uh, egg producer uh, for discarding chicks, volumes of chicks, uh, inhumanely. What, what did you yes. know about that? Uh, I, it was amazing that that had happened right before um, the conference, and, and I was incredibly impressed that there was an arrest in that case. Um, it, it, it involved... A, a method of discarding chicks where they were kind of tossed aside um, and down in a dam and left to uh, die on their own. And this was really aberrational, and, and that's what resulted in the arrest. And while I was very impressed with the fact that an arrest took place and that the um, SBCA involved itself in a farm animal issue, which is very, very rare, if not unheard of, in the United States, at the same time... Um, I saw that, if, if I understand the case correctly, and of course I only have an outsider's view of it, the problem was that it was done in this aberrational way, and if it had done in the more standard ways that the industry itself has, has said are appropriate, which includes maceration, that means grinding them up alive. If that had been done, there would have been no arrest, because that's, even though... South African law doesn't have written to, into it, as many American laws do, that customary farming practices are exempted from cruelty laws. At the same time as a practical matter, arrests don't take place when the industry is doing what the industry itself has decided is okay. And there was, there, uh, coincidentally, there was just an expose in the United States in the press of, of a, a, a huge egg producer that is macerating chicks and grinding them up alive. And even though this is a very standard practice, apparently both in South Africa and the United States, people were shocked. Yeah, I was about to say, it, it doesn't go down too good when people actually hear about this sort of thing happening these days. No, and I think the ballot initiatives are what really show that, that what is happening in the industry is just completely out of tune with what's, what people think is right. And when they are given the choice, even though a huge campaign was mounted by the industry in California telling people that this would dramatically increase the price of their food, which was not true, but still, uh, it, the argument was made, people still voted to protect the animals. It's amazing, it's astonishing how little one actually knows about uh, the sort of food production system and abattoirs and that sort of thing. It's amazing. It's almost like this this black hole area that the press just never touches on. People just don't want to know, and, and that's one of the things we have to deal with. Um, the dairy and egg industries in particular, Grant, it's just it's amazing like, how cruel. Yeah. The, the, unbelievably huge, and people, for example, won't eat veal because it's considered politically incorrect, but will down a glass of milk when in fact one industry feeds on the other industry and it's the dairy cows who are repeatedly and forcibly inseminated who are made to be pregnant in order to produce milk for humans to take it's their boy cows who become the veal calves so many people don't even realize this connection and the same thing as Marianne was saying with the egg industry there is absolutely no reason for the industry to keep the male chicks 
They're unnecessary. What, what else are people doing to advocate for farm animals? Well, at Farm Sanctuary, we have something called the Advocacy Campaign Team, and that's pretty much what I work on. Our big thing is that no matter who you are or what your interests, talents, or skills are, we can plug that into farm animal advocacy. For example, we have a tools and resources section on our website that gives you everything from tips on writing letters to the editor, tabling, leafleting, which are the more common grassroots efforts that we're all familiar with. But we like to go even beyond that. We have tips on how to throw a rock concert for farm animals. If you are an accountant, why not lend your accounting skills to an animal organization? If you are a singer, you know, you could write a song and post it on YouTube. There's ways of getting involved no matter who you are or what you do. We offer a comprehensive amount of literature and resources, but even beyond that, everybody can use what they're good at to speak up for farm animals. And just briefly, I mean, creating awareness uh, online predominantly, uh, you think it's made uh, quite a big difference, say, in the last sort of 10, 15 years? It, it helps a lot. I would say within the last two years, tremendously. Within the last 10 to 15 years, absolutely. But just with social networking sites such as Facebook, Twitter, these are the best things to happen to activism since the First Amendment, at least as far as I'm concerned. Uh, I, the amount of people who we've connected with as a result of this, it's just tremendous. We could really make a video viral, for example. We could really send around articles like we never could before. We could access information all the time. And as far as activism goes, you could even get involved with activism at 3 a.m. from your computer if you have a half an hour. No matter what, the internet has really opened doors for not only us, but different social justice movements as well. One of the moving experiences of being South Africa for both of us was the reminder that rapid social change and, and essentially peaceful social change in a situation that seemed impossible when I was in college can happen. And it's very, very inspiring. It inspired both of us. Yeah, this country is very blessed like that. Um, it's been great talking to you too. I, I want to ask something that I find very interesting and, I, and I'm hoping it's a it's an optimistic sort of future outlook is uh, along the lines of the biotechnology and nanotechnology where basically they're looking at hopefully producing things on the sort of molecular and cellular scale. So therefore, for your meat eaters out there, they're hopefully going to be able to produce their, their meat requirements without actually having sort of animals and cruelty and conditions, etc. involved. Um, I assume you're hopeful about this. So what, is the, what is the case? How I, optimistic I, are you? I think it's the one thing that's really going to get us out of this. I mean, we've created a nightmare. As you said before, there's an enormous hidden world of suffering. Enormous. Billions and billions of animals of suffering. And the one thing, it's hard to imagine we're just going to get out of it by everyone deciding to go vegan. Uh, hopefully most people will, but, but the idea that we can create meat and bypass the animals, and the meat will not only be as good as it will be better than. They can engineer this meat, or they will be able to engineer it in a way that's much healthier than, than meat raised from animals, and they won't have the environmental problems. They won't have the same... Uh, it, they'll be able to put your omega-3 uh, fatty acids in, in, in it, so you, it'll be much better for you. But hopefully in the future, everyone's desire for... They certainly don't have any need for meat, but if they desire meat and they want to keep it in their diet, they will be able to do so with a clean and and comfortably and healthfully through this product. I'm very excited about it. And just to add to that for just a second, in the meantime, it's not like people have to wait for that as their, you know, ultimate solution because there are a variety of fake meats available that are quite delicious. It's great talking to both of you. I appreciate your time and uh, look forward to also following up with you guys at some point in the future too. Best of luck and keep up the great work. Thank you Thanks so much. Take care.